Thank you very much, Carly, and really a pleasure uh, to have uh, everyone uh, here with us today. Um, so today we really uh, um, are really uh, uh, here to uh, to prepare ourselves for a um, an opportunity that I think is incredibly important. Um, uh, this is uh, really the opportunity for uh, the FDA to hear directly from you um, about uh, about long COVID, about the experience that um, uh, that you uh, that you're having. And as you will hear uh, from our uh, guest speakers uh, in a moment, um, this is quite a unique uh, opportunity for the FDA itself to be uh, to be hearing directly from you. Uh, so just think about it that uh, many of the people um, at the FDA very rarely have an opportunity to, to hear directly from, uh, from you, the people who are ultimately gonna be uh, potentially using a treatment that is approved by, by the FDA. So it's a very unique opportunity and we wanted to make sure that we uh, maximize the impact that you uh, can make uh, during that meeting. So, um, you know, for us to be as prepared as possible, we invited uh, a two a very, very experienced uh, people um, to guide us um, uh, into this uh, into this opportunity and really uh, how to uh, to make the best out of, uh, of out, out of this time in your opportunity to engage directly with the FDA. So, our uh, guests today are Larry Bauer. Uh, Larry has worked at the NIH um, for many years as a clinical researcher and then at the FDA. And uh, over there, he was particularly focused on uh, research for rare diseases, um, which uh, at the time, really, uh, the, uh, uh, the FDA was just starting to, uh, to learn about and uh, the patient engagement uh, opportunity was very, very important. So uh, Larry was there for 10 years. And since then, really has worked with a number of rare disease groups uh, to prepare for these kind of meetings with the FDA. Next, please. Um, and also with us is uh, uh, James Valentine. And uh, James has worked uh, uh, really uh, at the FDA at the time uh, that uh, the idea of bringing the patient voice into medical uh, review was just developed. And uh, James was uh, instrumental in making this big part of uh, the review process for, uh, for the FDA and help to develop and launch the patient-focused drug development initiative, uh, which is really the, uh, the program under which um, our opportunity uh, is to, to share that with the FDA. And for the past 15 years, James uh, worked uh, with many uh, patient groups to prepare for this kind of, uh, of a meeting and also as part of the regulatory process uh, in addition to that. So uh, Larry and uh, James, thank you for uh, being with us today. In, uh, since then, in your in your practice, you work uh, with many organizations. Uh, you have prepared uh, many groups uh, for this type of interaction with uh, with the FDA. So we're delighted that uh, that you're uh, you're here with us today and share your experience and help us to be better prepared for the meeting with the FDA. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. This is James Valentine, and you'll be hearing from my colleague Larry Bauer. Uh, in just a few moments. And we're so excited to, to get to share some of our learnings and experiences over the last, um, well, well, 10 years of patient-focused drug development, um, both in our time at the FDA and, and time since leaving the agency, being able to work with so many different patient communities and share that with all of you as you anticipate this upcoming uh, April 25th uh, FDA PFD meeting on long COVID. So just to set the stage a little bit before we get into some of the meat of our conversation here, um, you know, for those of you that may not know, you know, patient-focused drug development, or you'll hear us calling it PFDD, it is this exciting opportunity where FDA gets to hear directly from patient stakeholders. So uh, of course, those individuals living with uh, a condition like long COVID, but also their direct caregivers, you know, spouses, parents, family members, um, you know, that get to share the real day-to-day -day experiences of living with long COVID. Um, this is a one-time opportunity, to, you know, uh, there'll only be one uh, long COVID PFDD meeting. Um, so it's an important, um, you know, time where FDA is taking time out of their day, you know, to spend almost a full day together with us um, to learn about this condition. Um, so the, the main goal here is to not hear from other stakeholders like researchers and clinicians, but to hear from you all, the patient and caregivers, um, who really are experts in what it is to live with long COVID, 
um, with the goal, you know, the outcome of this meeting being to help improve the development of new drugs that are in the pipeline and inform, you know, different regulatory decisions that will be made. And we'll be talking about what some of that actually looks like. You can move to the next slide, please. So the purpose of this meeting uh, more specifically is to educate FDA and, and of course other stakeholders like those who are developing drugs for long COVID to understand the different aspects of the patient experience. This is what it is like to live with long COVID, um, how long COVID actually impacts your day-to-day -day life and activities in your life. Um, not only your experience with the, the disease's symptoms and and health impacts, but also you know what you're trying to do to manage it. And ultimately looking towards the future, what might a meaningful treatment for you or your loved ones long COVID actually look like? Next slide. So you might be wondering, you know, why should you be participating in this meeting um, that FDA's uh, running here? Well, this is an important opportunity to have your voices heard. And since FDA approves all treatments for long COVID, they need to know what's important to you. And not just to any one individual one of you, but to hear as many voices as possible as part of this, because the, you know there is power in numbers of really painting this picture of what long, long COVID is and what the community's priorities are. And ultimately this knowledge is gonna help impact their decision make, making, making sure that better treatments and even potentially faster approvals for long COVID come through the pipeline. Next slide. You also might be wondering why now, you know, uh, you know what, what is, you know, uh, making this, you know, a, a priority for FDA now? Well, uh, I can tell you, and Larry, Larry knows as well, that historically the patient's voice has been absent from the drug development process. And so it wasn't until a drug was approved by FDA, you know, and sometimes we weren't sure, you know, if those things that were measured in trials actually mattered to patients. Or even worse, a trial was failing and the drug company or FDA needed input from patients to understand the, pro the problems with what was going on in the study. And so rather than be so reactive and wait till so late in, this, in the game, once you know, trials were already conducted and it was the, kind of the end of the development stage, um, you know, FDA recognized, and I think now industry and everybody collectively recognizes that it's important to hear the voices of patients and caregivers from the beginning of the process, and of course, throughout. And this has really been a priority for FDA, and so much so that, you know, 10, well, a little over 10 years ago now, we created PFDD. But importantly, FDA recognized that this was important enough to choose and select to run one of these meetings. FDA has only um, run so many of these meetings over the years. And so um, clearly, uh, internally at FDA, this is something that uh, not just patient engagement being a priority, but long COVID is a, prior a priority for the agency. Next slide. So some of the uh, more specific information that we're gonna cover in this um, uh, webinar, I'm gonna start with a background on FDA and drug development. We know that some of you may uh, have some experience with clinical trials, maybe even have advocated um, to the FDA before, but many of you have not. And so we want to make sure that everyone has some of that same foundational knowledge about FDA and, and you know, uh, how drugs uh, get approved. Um, once we understand a little bit of that background, um, Larry's going to take over and he's going to talk about where your voices fit into that development pathway and those FDA decisions. And he's going to talk about how this PFDD meeting actually provides FDA that information and, and will give you more specific information about what we expect to be a part of this upcoming FDA PFDD meeting, as well as some more practical information in terms of logistics and expected format and some tips that we have for you in terms of participating. So let's go ahead and jump into it uh, and start talking and giving you some of this background about FDA and drug development. If we can go to the next slide, you know, this really, uh, when drugs go, go through what we call R&D, R stands for research and D stands for development, research really is the first step in all of this. And we have to do basic science research, um, you know, whether that's at the NIH or academic institutions, or maybe even, you know, nonprofit advocacy organizations are taking on some of this work. And the idea behind this is to try to understand the underpinnings of the, the disease and what's causing some of the different symptoms and health effects 
because that gives us opportunities to know where to intervene in that disease process. When we know where to enter, you know, opportunities to intervene in the disease process, we can screen or maybe even develop new technologies to try to intervene uh, as medicines to treat those disease symptoms or the underlying disease itself. Um, when we do this and we've identified a promising compound, whether that's repurposing something that already exists or developing something new, then we can go into that D part, the development. Um, so if we go to the next slide, when we start development, we uh, typically will be starting in what's called preclinical development, which just means before the clinic or before going into the humans. And so what we're trying to do here is take that you know, potential medicine and start to test it, whether it's in animal studies or other kind of laboratory tests, kind of think of it as like the, the proverbial uh, Petri dish kind of uh, experiments. Um, we're, we're trying to really understand the safety profile. So that's called the toxicology of the drug um, to make sure that's reasonably safe to take into studies with humans. Um, but we also wanna be able to understand if we, we think that it actually has you know, the potential to be effective. We'll never be able to know for sure in an animal study or a, you know, other type of test um, in the preclinical environment, whether that's gonna translate to a benefit for actual people living with the disease, but there's often animal models and other cell lines that we can use to help us at least get a sense that, that it, the, the um, molecule is having you know, the kind of target engagement and maybe even some non-clinical evidence of effect that can really be encouraging and help us you know, pick the right doses um, you know, to take into the clinic, into human clinical trials. So when we've done this preclinical development work, um, we then go into what, you know, want to take that to FDA um, in what's called an investigational new drug application or IND, which is the application that allows us to do clinical trials in people. So if we move to the next slide, that IND submission, it contains those uh, preclinical studies, the pharmacology studies being those that are evaluating the drug's kind of benefit and effect. Um, the toxicology studies being those safety studies. It also contains other information. You know, from the very beginning, we not only want to make sure we understand the drug's safety and, and potential efficacy as much as possible, we also want to make sure that it's a high quality drug that's being manufactured in a way that we know what you're, we're getting. You know, are we getting the right amount of the active ingredient? Are we making sure there's not harmful impurities that might hurt people? And so that information about that manufacturing and testing gets included as well as the plans, the clinical pro protocols and other information that you know, sets out you know, the clinical trial that's being proposed to be done. And that first clinical trial that's usually posed at this stage is called a phase one study. And so the goals of a phase one study, these are the smallest and shortest studies. Sometimes they may even start with only a single dose of a drug, even though it might be for a chronic condition like long COVID. Um, you know, we may start with single doses, we may then go to multiple doses, um, but for, for a short period of time. And here we get to start to see the most common side effects of a drug. Um, because, you know, we're not giving it to lots and lots of people, we don't get to see those really rare side effects. But we get to see, you know, what what happens, you know, with, with most people that will get a drug. Um, we can then, you know, determine, you know, whether there's reasonable safety based off of, you know, common side effects, um, we can't really at this stage understand how well the drug is actually working in terms of treating the disease or symptoms, um, but we can look to see how the drug is metabolized and excreted. So is the drug getting to the right places of the body to have the effect? Is it staying in the body long enough to be able to have an effect? Those types of questions. So once we've uh, understood that, we can move into what's called phase two of development. Here, these studies are a little bit longer um, and, and a little bit larger. Um, we're emphasizing here now for the first time the drug's effectiveness. So while the phase two is not going to usually provide definitive uh, evidence of whether a drug works or not, um, you know, gives us what's called proof of concept information. So we can uh, evaluate using different biomarkers, you know, which are just measures of of a drug's disease, of a, uh, sorry, of a disease process, 
um, you, you know, whether that's through a blood draw or an imaging marker, um, or we can, might actually be able to start to see resolution of, of early resolution of symptoms um, in patients. Um, you know, we get to see here, uh, you know, also be, uh, to see what is actually the, the real drug effect versus maybe what, um, you know, are, are what pa patients usually experience on their own, even without a drug, by adding a control arm, um, with the most commonly known type of control arm being a placebo control, where, you know, this is the, uh, the sugar pill, so to speak where uh, we get to people don't know whether they're on drug or placebo. So they, they're not going to be biased in you know, saying whether they feel better or not um, because they don't know if they're getting the drug or not. Um, in this, we, while we're starting to look at the drug's proof of concept at uh, effectiveness, we also are always having a, a focus on safety at the same time. So now we get to start seeing with a little bit longer dosing, you know, what, what uh, types of side effects are starting to pop up. And also because now we're getting into, you know, a slightly larger population of people, uh, more people are being included, uh, we start to get to see, you know, other types of safety issues that might pop up, you know, just by different people with different backgrounds and, and you know, maybe different uh, other drugs that they're on, um, concomitant medications, you know, how that changes the safety profile from the more controlled phase one setting. So after phase two, we get to go into phase three, and this is the, the uh, final stage of, of drug development. These are, you know, what are sometimes talked about in, you know, company press releases or in news articles, excuse me, as pivotal studies or registration studies. Um, these are the studies that are the, the large um, scale you know, almost always randomized and placebo controlled trials, um, you know, for chronic diseases will be, you know, often, you know, six months, 12 months, maybe even longer, um, because we want to be able to understand in treating a chronic condition, you know, assuming that a drug's not actually curing the disease, which almost no drugs actually do, um, you know, we want to be able to see not only the initial effect, but the duration of that effect. Um, these studies are also large enough that we can start to look at how the drug affects different populations or subpopulations. So whether that's, you know, uh, by sex, by age, by race, uh, by disease severity, um, you know, how does this drug safety and efficacy profile different, differ between those different groups of people? And again, you know, here we get to do our longest term safety evaluation, um, where we're now looking at the largest number of people that we've studied to date in a single study. So we might pick up some of the more rare side effects, maybe some things that are really serious, but happen in just a very, very, very small proportion of people that take the, take the drug product. So if we go to the next slide, so once we've done all of this work and we've gathered all of this data over the courses of the phase one, two, and three clinical trials, that preclinical information, all of this gets um, summarized and brought to the FDA in what's called a, a pre-new drug application or NDA or pre-biologics license application or BLA, so, uh, pre-BLA meeting. So an NDA or BLA, these are the marketing applications that get put in front of FDA where FDA decides whether or not to approve the drug. Um, an FDA, uh, you know, before receiving these applications wants to have this, you know, pre-NDA or pre-BLA meeting because they get a chance to talk with the company to understand the data, to identify potential, you know, what's the key data, what are the potential issues with that data, or even just what, what information needs to be prioritized and, and what analyses need to be run when the company actually does submit that NDA or BLA to FDA. So assuming that there's you know, no major issues that require additional studies um, to, you know, then the company can, can submit its NDA or BLA to FDA. That NDA or BLA includes all of that information, um, not just in summary form, but the actual underlying data. This is actually different than what other countries require. In the US, FDA actually gets the data so they can do their own independent analyses of that data. 
and quality control it. Um, and so, you know, that's what FDA is, is looking to do as part of um, that submission process. If we go to the next slide, once FDA has that in hand and they determine that that NDA or BLA is actually complete, meaning it has all the information it needs in order to conduct its review, it will then assign a review team. And then that's when they really roll up their sleeves and start to uh, understand from all of that data, what are the drugs, you know, benefits? So what's the, what effectiveness has been demonstrated? Um, you know, what can they conclude from all the safety inner information? And ultimately they have to determine whether the benefits of the drug outweigh the risks of the drug. And so that piece uh, is not the scientific piece. You know, that's a, a, a subjective piece where FDA has to, based off of, you know, what patients are currently experiencing and the risks they're willing to tolerate, which is going to be very different from one condition to another, they then have to kind of do that balance of, of drug benefits against, against risk. And so that well, you'll hear Larry talk about this later. This is a really key point where it's important for FDA to understand what's well, important to you all. So that, that way, when they're doing that subjective benefit risk balancing, they're doing it you know, in an informed manner that's actually taking into account your goals and your preferences. As part of this review, FDA is also looking at the manufacturing methods and controls. This is that quality piece um, to make sure that when this drug, you know, gets manufactured in mass, um, you know, on the, for, the, for anyone that's prescribed it on the market, that again, it's we're protecting patients by making sure they're getting enough of the right active ingredient. We're making sure that there's not those impurities. Um, I do want to note that oftentimes you'll hear about FDA advisory committees. These are committees that FDA can convene to meet while they're doing this review. And they'll ask the committee to vote and weigh in on different scientific issues and even the approvability of the drug. But it's important to remember that these committees, you know, the input they give is just advisory. So FDA, you know, may, you know, want for one, they have more information than is presented to these committees. Um, but they also, you know, um, you know, even putting that aside. Uh, still, you know, have the independence to make a decision that's different than what an advisory committee uh, might advise. So if we go to the next slide, you know, so even once FDA does approve a drug um, or a biological product, um, the, the job of the regulators and the drug companies doesn't stop there. We have to continuously, you know, we'll continuously learn about a drug's safety profile once it's out on the market. Um, you know, as many, you know, many, many more people actually get it uh, than we're in clinical trials. Um, and they'll be taking it for longer than clinical trials were conducted. And so you would expect to see new safety signals and information arise. And so FDA, you know, looks at that information as it comes in and continues to determine whether the, the uh, benefits of the drug continue to, to outweigh the risks of the drug. So now that we've talked about, you know, the, the research and development kind of uh, framework and how drugs get from kind of the petri dish all the way, you know, to your doctors and pharmacists and, and into your uh, medicine cabinets, so to speak. We can go to the next slide. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, where exactly FDA fits into that. So if we can go to the next slide, you know, so one thing that I think is really important to understand is that all of those stages of drug development, um, FDA is not actually themselves doing that development of drugs. That's left to the researchers, the pharmaceutical companies, um, again, even nonprofit groups that may be conducting different disease research and drug development. So it's up to others to decide what products to test, um, how to go about testing them, and what conditions they want to test them in. FDA, of course, um, you know, will give a lot of input to companies, you know, based off of what they choose to do their research in. But it's really not, FDA doesn't have any ability to direct them to do any particular drug development that they don't want to do. Um, another important point here is that FDA does not actually do any of that testing. So once a, you know, research has been proposed to FDA and FDA has been given, given some input on it, FDA is not actually the ones that run those trials. They're not on site while those trials are being conducted. Again, this is the researchers who the, the drug companies are hiring. Um, to be the, you know, ones conducting the studies. Um, 
you know, they're the ones that are, are doing that actual work. Um, you know, any drug, uh, clinical trial does get submitted to FDA um, here in the United States. So that way FDA, again, you know, even if they're not being asked specific questions, can make sure that, um, you know, there's no undue research risk. Um, and they can also offer their advice to companies on the design of those studies. Um, you know, but again, they're not the ones actually doing the, the studies themselves. If you go to the next slide, um, beyond kind of, you know, drug studies, there's some other aspects of, of drug approvals and drugs being on the market that FDA, um, you know, is and is not involved in. So one area is FDA does not have authority to regulate the practice of medicine. So what I mean here is, you know, FDA doesn't regulate the doctors or the nurse practitioners or the other prescribers who are, you know, actually making the decisions of where, you know, certain approved drugs should be used. FDA only is regulating the drug companies and what they can, you know, once a drug's approved, they regulate what drug companies can say in terms of marketing of the products. The doctors are actually free to prescribe FDA approved drugs for, you know, uses that maybe aren't exactly FDA approved. You know, this is called off-label use, you know, and that's regulated under the practice of medicine and, and um, you know, medical malpractice kind of keeps, keeps doctors in check, um, you know, on these issues. But this is something that's outside of what FDA does. So, um, you know, FDA has no way to um, control or have any role in, you know, kind of, you know, what doctors do and don't do with approved FDA drugs. Um, FDA also doesn't regulate the price of medicine. So once FDA approves the drug, they don't have any control over whether, you know, it's the, you know, the Center for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services or CMS, you know, the federal government, you know, whether they cover the drug, whether private insurance companies cover the drug. Um, in fact, FDA doesn't know anything about drug prices. And, and even if it had that information, could not take that into account as part of its approval decision. It's looking at just the direct drug benefits and the drug safety risk. Um, and that's, and that's you know, what they're accounting for as part of their approval decision. Um, so any issues related to um, you know, drug pricing and drug access, as well as the first thing we talked about in terms of you know, healthcare providers and the care that they give to you all as patients or your loved ones, those are things that are going to be out of the scope of this PFDD meeting. You know, along the same lines, you know, other um, issues related to kind of disability rights um, and disability benefits, those similarly are outside of FDA's purview. So are going to be the kinds of things that we don't want to focus on in this meeting we want to really hear, understand where the opportunities are for drugs to actually help you um, and what those unmet medical needs are that you have. So if we go to the next slide, um, I've talked a lot about what FDA doesn't do, but I do want to just emphasize that while FDA kind of, you know, there's certain places where certainly certain aspects of, of research and development aren't in their control, they do have this mission to promote the public health. And if you think about it, these FDA reviewers, they've seen every drug <laughs> trial that's, you know, been conducted, you know, what's worked, what hasn't worked. So they have a lot of technical expertise that they can provide to researchers and drug companies um, along the way. And, and drug companies, you know, they do, they, they meet with FDA at all those, in between all those different stages of drug development, if not more, um, to seek FDA input. And so this in Insight that you're giving FDA at this PFDD meeting is going to help them in all of those meetings take, of course, what they know from their expertise, but being able to more specifically apply it by better understanding the, the experience that people with long COVID have, um, they're going to be able to give much better advice to drug companies throughout development. If we go to this next slide here, you can see that uh, I've only covered this uh, all in a snapshot at a high level. Uh, if you're interested to learn more about how FDA regulates medical products or you know, different opportunities beyond the PFDD meeting that we're focusing on today, you can find more information on this FDA webpage um, and these slides will be available so you can reference this website later. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Larry Bauer, who's now gonna talk about patient-focused drug development 
um, and where your voices in this meeting fit into that paradigm I just talked about. Larry? Yeah, thanks so much, James. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so James just gave us a really great overview of what the FDA does. Um, I just want to remind everyone that the meeting that we're speaking about is being completely designed, ran by, and everything. It's by the FDA. We are here today just to give you some background information about patient-focused drug development and things like that, but we actually are not involved in the planning. It's, a, it's an FDA meeting. And the purpose of this meeting is that, um, James alluded to this a bit, is that the FDA wanted to come up with a more systematic way of gathering perspectives from patients and caregivers about the conditions that they uh, experience and the available treatment options that they use. Um, this kind of information helps inform their understanding of the context for benefit and risk assessments and decision making for new drugs. I'll get a into this benefit risk in just a second. And also patient inputs, you know, hearing directly from patient really helps the FDA during drug development, as well as during their review of an application for marketing a new drug. Um, next slide. So what is benefit risk assessment? James started to speak a little bit about this, but for every new drug that comes to the FDA, and you know, the FDA is responsible. They have this huge responsibility of making a decision. Will this drug be approved and become available in pharmacies? Or do they say, no, we are not going to approve it? Part of this is by doing a very um, formal benefit and risk assessment. Um, so the, the aspects, they do this for every single drug that they review. There's, these are the different components of a benefit risk assessment. So they want to analyze the condition. What is the disease? Um, you know, what kind of symptoms does the disease have? How impactful are those symptoms? Uh, how do they impact people's lives? Which one impact their lives the most? They also want to hear about current treatment options that are available. So what are people currently doing? Whether they're actually, maybe there already are some FDA approved treatments, or maybe there's nothing ever been approved by the FDA for this condition. Also, people are sometimes using things like physical therapy, occupational therapy, acupuncture, you know, CBD, other things that, that maybe are helping their condition. And it's in these two first things. This is where our meeting is really going to help the FDA. The second part of the benefit risk assessment is determining the actual benefits of the drug and the actual risks. This kind of information comes when they analyze the clinical trials that were done for the, for the drug. So they look at all the clinical trial data. They see, you know, did people in the trial benefit from the new drug? And then what were the side effects or the risks that people experienced while on the drug? And are those risks, are they something that we can deal with maybe with other medications? Uh, next slide. So for this uh, PFDD meeting on long COVID, um, it, it, the meeting is a framework for discussing questions that the FDA developed related to benefit risk. Um, these questions that you'll hear, we'll, I'll go into some details about them in a minute, really help them in their decision making uh, for you know whether or not to approve a new drug. And the questions were developed by FDA to communicate the most important information related to long COVID. And FDA has really emphasized that active patient involvement and participation is the key to the success of these meetings. And that's part of the reason we're having this webinar today is to get you excited. Um, next slide. At the end of the meeting, all everything that was heard uh, will be summarized into a written voice of the patient report. FDA will prepare this document. It's a summary of the caregiver and audience testimony, any polling that they do, any submitted written comments or oral comments. And this document will be a public document available to anyone. And it's a key communication for FDA review staff, as well as drug developers, about what is most important in a treatment to patients and caregivers. And FDA really wants this information because it informs them about ways that meaningful treatments for long COVID can be developed. Um, next slide. So now just a little nitty gritty about how you can actually participate in the meeting. Um, 
So who is this meeting for? It's for long COVID patients, as well as their caregivers or care partners. It's for FDA staff, whoever wants to attend. It's for pharma and biotech companies that might have interest in developing treatments for long COVID, and basically anyone interested in learning on this topic. The meeting will take place April 25th from 10 a.m. to 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's a virtual meeting, so people can participate from anywhere in the US or all over the world. Um, the meeting will be conducted with live translation in both English and Spanish. Uh, and there's a link here that you can, how you can join the interactive live stream. Uh, as James mentioned, you'll get, you can get a copy of these slides afterwards and you can click on this link to uh, register for the meeting. Um, next. So some of the questions that the FDA has developed for this specific meeting, um, there's three topics that we'll go into and some of the questions that they'll be posing to uh, people living with long COVID. The first topic is living with long COVID, disease symptoms and daily impacts that matter most to patients. FDA wants to know what symptoms of long COVID have the most significant impact on your life. Examples like pain, difficulty thinking, fatigue, heart palpitations, blood clots, depression, anxiety, et cetera. Uh, number two is, are there specific activities that are important to you that you cannot do at all or as fully as you would like because of your long COVID? These are things like maybe reading, sleeping, exercising. Um, next slide. Um, to continue with this, is there a, a particular impact of long COVID, such as a need to work a reduced work schedule or inability to complete daily tasks, anxiety or depression that worries you? If so, what worries you the most, especially maybe moving forward into the future? And thirdly, how has your long COVID changed from the original diagnosis to now? Have you noticed difference in the severity? or a change in symptoms? You know, have symptoms gotten a little bit better? Have they gotten worse over time or kind of stayed the same? Um, next slide. Uh, then they'll move into a second topic. These, this topic is gonna to be patient perspectives on current approaches to treatment. Some of the questions they might ask to the, the panel and people calling in are, what are you currently doing to treat or manage your long COVID? Um, examples can include prescription medicines, over-the-counter products, nutritional supplements, and other therapies that people might be using. They'd like to know how has your treatment regimen changed over time and why? So why did you change any of these treatments? Or maybe why did you start using something new? And what factors went into your decision making when it came to selecting a course of management for your long COVID? Um, next slide. And then they want to know a little bit about, would you say that your long COVID today is well managed? Please explain. So, so what's being managed well and where is there room for growth? And uh, assuming there's no complete cure for your long COVID, what specific things would you look for in an ideal treatment for your long COVID? Of course, we'd all like to see a complete cure, but maybe uh, is there a particular symptom of long COVID such as fatigue or the brain fog or loss of sense of smell and taste that you would prioritize for treatment? If so, for you, which symptom would you prioritize? And what would you consider a successful treatment outcome? Uh, next. The third topic of the day that will be talked about is patients' perspectives on clinical trials for long COVID. Some questions here are, if you considered participating or have participated in a clinical trial for long COVID, tell us about your experience. What factors of the clinical trial enabled you to participate? And what factors of the clinical trial maybe made it more difficult for you to participate? And how would the following factors weigh into your decision if you were considering participating in a clinical trial? The clinical trial intervention, for uh, examples may include the side effects of the medical intervention or how it was administered. And then B, the logistics of the clinical trial. And examples of this might include the duration of the trial. So how many weeks or months does the trial go on for? Is the trial fully remote or does it require you to travel to clinic? Um, and what is the number of in-person clinic visits that are required? How far is the clinic site from your home? 
And also, is there going to be a chance that you're, you'll receive a placebo medication or not, which is uh, considered a control group for the study? And then what outcomes for long COVID are most important to measure in a trial setting? Examples like reduction in pain, brain fog, fatigue, uh, maybe improvement in your ability to perform daily activities such as reading, sleeping, or exercising. So like, like I said, this whole section will be all about clinical trial participation, which the FDA uh, does weigh in on when companies are developing new products. Um, next. So there'll be a, a, the, the format for the meeting. We'll have a panel of patients for each of these topics that they'll set the foundation for a broader discussion. Um, there might be polling questions that you'll be able to respond to. And then there'll be, we'll move to a discussion with patients in the audience. Um, and people will probably be given the opportunity to call in with comments live. Um, next. So a few tips for participating in the meeting. Please remember FDA's role and the purpose of the meeting and those things that James mentioned about what FDA does and the things that they don't have control over. Maybe look at these discussion questions in advance. And if you have something important to share, please call in. It's okay to reiterate a feeling or experience somebody has already spoken about, but give it a personal or unique perspective. Keep your comments concise and focused. And you can send in, there'll be a way for you to send in additional comments after the meeting. Um, next slide. So participate in the meeting. Uh, you know, you can do this remotely. Please register for the meeting in advance. Um, you can actually submit comments now and for 30 days after the meeting. And your comments will all be included in the voice of the patient report uh, that's produced by the FDA. Next. So this is your opportunity to be part of the process. Know that you can have a meaningful impact on clinical trial design as well as drug development, and your collective voices must be heard, both at the beginning of the process of drug development to help companies design trials that meet your needs and to help the FDA at the end of the process in assessing the risks and benefits with a full understanding of the impact of long COVID on your lives. So please join on the 25th of April and make a difference. Uh, next. So now we'll move into a Q&A and I see Ovid has come back online and I think Ovid, you're gonna kind of manage the Q&A, so. I think you're on mute, Ovid. Yep, sorry. That's the most, uh, the most common uh, uh, comment on any Zoom uh, webinar, <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, Larry and James, thank you very much for a, a, a wonderful presentation. I think you really uh, uh, set the scene up for, uh, for us. Um, I'll start with maybe a few questions that we received even you know, before the webinar, and then we'll go into some more specific questions. I, I guess the first question, uh, you know, from, uh, from your experience, um, how can we really get the, uh, the FDA to, be, uh, um, to understand the urgency and really be, uh, um, be there um, and, and really make sure that the FDA uh, wants to, uh, to make a difference uh, for, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for all of us? How can we, make the, how can we deliver this, this sense of urgency to the FDA? Yeah, I, it's a really good question. I'm sure Larry and I both have have thoughts on this, um, but just to start, you know, I think the most important way to do this to get FDA to to understand and feel the same urgency that each and every one of you feel is to be very share your very personal experiences. I know it can be somewhat sometimes challenging to kind of you know often you know it's it's human nature not to to focus in on on the negative and to share maybe where where you're persevering and where things are, you know, you're the, the things that you can do well. Um, but in this meeting, you know, we really want you to pull back that curtain for, so that way FDA and drug developers really see for you as an individual or your loved one living with long COVID, you know, what are the real impacts, you know, tell in, in vivid description, what that looks like, how that makes you feel, what that means in terms of whether it's, you know, working or, you know, hobbies and things that you love that help, you know, define who you were as a person that are impacted, um, family and, and, you know, friend, family relationships and friendships, you know, I mean, these are all people at the FDA at the end of the day, 
and they're going to be able to relate best when you make it real for them and, and make it, you know, tell those personal stories that really bring the impacts to life. Yeah, I just wanted to add, while I worked at the FDA, you know, when, when a new, dr you know, uh, a drug was developed for a disease, especially a rare disease or a new disease like long COVID, the only way that the FDA review staff can learn about that disease is by reading research articles, speaking with doctors, and that gives you a very narrow and limited understanding of the disease to really understand the impacts. Like James was just saying, you are the only people that can really help the FDA understand what it's really like to live with long COVID. And I have to say that when I was at the FDA, when we met with patient groups, like the way that FDA is going to meet with long COVID, it really made the, the FDA take this disease more seriously to understand it and to, like to understand it from a very human perspective. You know, they need to understand it scientifically, but also to have these human impacts. Yeah, that's very, so that leads to uh, a question that came now, uh, uh, you know, during the webinar, would you say it's more effective to provide uh, the emotional aspect of uh, of the experience or more objective and kind of more clinical um, or both? Uh, I mean, maybe I'll add one uh, one additional question. Um, other burdens of, uh, of the disease, for instance, the economic impact, uh, you know, what are the things that uh, the people uh, experience that lead to uh, out of pocket costs or other impacts on their lives? Is that uh, something that the FDA uh, um, need to hear about or would like to hear about? Yeah, again, an another really good question. You know, what I always, you know, think is talk about the disease and the condition and the impacts and the way that is natural for you. So if you're someone who, you know, uh, may, whether or not you have a scientific background, a lot of people become, you know, experts in the science just because you you have to, right? And, you know, no one else is, is doing that homework for you. And, and, and as many people do talk about, um, you know, a lot of doctors don't even necessarily know what's going on with them. So, you know, it's totally okay to use, you know, talk in terms of scientific terminology. But if that's, you know, not your experience and your experience is really just kind of describing what it is that you live with, that is, is going to be, have a huge impact impact too. So speak in whatever terms you're comfortable in and, and FDA is there to, and specifically, you know, the moderator, their job is going to be to work and talk to you to, you know, understand in a way that's going to help FDA your, your experiences and what is important to you. For sure, it's going to be emotional we, you know, nobody expects this to be, you know, a meeting full of robots, uh, you know, this is, it, this is immensely personal and emotional and, you know, you should not feel ashamed if, if you're a person who, you know, if you think that you might choke up or, or have, have some emotion when you're speaking, you know, I think that's important for FDA to see as well. Um, in terms of, you know, focusing on some of the financial and economic impacts I mean, certainly to the degree that, you know, the, the actual symptoms and health effects of, of long COVID are maybe impacting your ability to work and they're putting strains on your family and your well-being. Um, that's kind of because it's a, it's related to the disease itself, um, you know, something that's important to share, but really when it comes more to price of price and cost of medicines and access issues, um, you know, that's something that really is just outside of FDA's purview. That's right. Larry, did you want to um, say more on that? Sure. Yeah, I see those two things of the, the, the physical symptoms and the psychological, emotional impacts as clearly linked to each other. For instance, if somebody reported and was talking about, you know, a loss of taste, a loss of smell, that's reporting a physical function. But then the impact, you know, Cooking, going out to eat with my friends used to be one of my favorite pastimes. You know, it's led to me having feelings of depression. This is what it, it, you know, it's really impacted my life where I, you know, I can't cook food the same way I used to, those kinds of things. Those are the, some of the impacts are what the FDA, no one can know what that's like except for you. So we, we do want to hear about both things. How severe is the loss of, of taste and smell, you know, in that particular case? and how, what are the impacts? So both are important. 
Great. Well, thank you very much. Now, uh, another topic that uh, that came up, and I think that's kind of unique to um, uh, to, to this situation with long COVID. The question is um, uh, really about um, you know when we talk about long COVID, sort of embedded in this name is the uh, the notion that uh, the person had uh, had COVID to begin with, COVID nineteen to begin with. Um, however, uh, we know that uh, certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, uh, tests were not available. Um, PCR tests were not available at all for a period of time, and then uh, after a certain point, uh, those home tests became more um, uh, more prevalent. And so, uh, the question is: uh, is it uh, is it important for the FDA to understand those challenges? And although the person may have all the symptoms, um, would they qualify for treatment if they even if they don't have this positive PCR test? And that's something that. Um, um, you know, I think uh, would be very important for FDA to uh, to, to understand and hear uh, from uh, from any of you who have really haven't had a chance uh, because of the circumstances not not to get that. Um, James, Larry, what what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, at this absolutely. You know, part of you know that this is really unique um, in that you know how do you even define who we're talking about when we're talking about people with long COVID, and so you know, that is going to impact who qualifies for clinical trials. And of course, who gets studied in clinical trials is going to impact who drugs get approved for, which is going to impact ability to access those products um, once they're approved. And so particularly, I think, during um, the third topic, when we're talking about clinical trials and who should be able to participate and you know, I think you absolutely have to share you know, your concerns that, you know, I, you myself as a long COVID patient, or at least a potential one, I would be interested in products for long COVID, even though I don't have that PCR confirmation, you know, or I mean, even earlier in the meeting, you know, kind of raising that as the context of, and background of who you are and your relationship to this condition, and I, because I do think it's important for, for FDA to understand that because it may not be reasonable to restrict, you know, therapies and that are in development to just individuals that have, um, you know, that, that confirmation, um, or it may be important to, you know, uh, you know, understand and be able to understand how products are different, maybe in those where we for sure have that PCR confirmation versus you know, others um, who don't have that. So I think these are really important issues and you should not assume that FDA has this on their radar. So absolutely raise those. Yeah, and you know, when James was talking about the FDA earlier, you know, one of the things the FDA does is when a company is ready to start a human subject research study with a, with a drug, they have to send it to the FDA for the FDA to review. And so maybe if their inclusion criteria says that you have to have, you know, the positive test for COVID, well, maybe they could consider having a second arm of the trial with people that were unconfirmed or something like that to try to bring, you know, but they need to hear from you that it's important that all of you want to participate in clinical trials. Great. So there are um, many more questions. I'm not sure we're going to have time to address all of them uh, on this webinar. And uh, um, but maybe just to bring one more topic, um, I think a lot of people are interested uh, in specific, you know, treatments that they may be uh, using. And it could be nutraceuticals, it could be uh, vitamins, um, it could be off-label drugs. Um, is that something that uh, the FDA uh, I should hear about or would like to hear about uh, in this uh, in this uh, PFDD meeting? Yes. So when FDA, and, and this is a great place to make this point, at certain points, you know, because Larry and I, you know, uh, help moderate certain externally led meetings. And so we often default to talking about treatments. And I think FDA will do the same thing. When, when FDA, and this relates to that topic too that Larry went over in terms of what are, what kind of treatment approaches are available to you, how well are they working, um, you know, what are the downsides of them? That's not just approved drug treatments or, you know, healthcare interventions. That can be things that are off-label, that can be over-the-counter products and nutraceuticals, um, as well as other more holistic approaches, even, even something like a lifestyle modification. I, because of the fatigue 
you know, of long COVID, I had to move my bedroom to the first floor, you know, because it's too much to go up and down the stairs, however many times a day, right? So even that is a quote unquote treatment. It's really anything you use or do that tries to make living life with long COVID a little bit easier counts as a treatment. And you should absolutely be sharing your, your experiences with where they help, even if it's only a little, sometimes things that help a little, that translates to a huge quality of life impact. So don't be afraid to share those, those experiences. Yeah I, yeah, I think this is especially important for long COVID. Long COVID is new. It's not well understood. And as new clinical trials are being developed for, um, you know, for a new drug or a new product, if there's something that people in the long COVID community are using that has a, a, a high amount of benefit, you're gonna, the FDA is gonna wanna control for that in the study. They, they'll wanna know who's using that as well as the new drug, because you know, are the benefits that they're seeing in the study, are they from the new drug or are they from this, this other thing that, that people are doing? You know, so it's, it is important that FDA understands fully what, you know, what people are using and how much they help. Great. So um, I will uh, just make one, uh, one additional comment uh, uh, or answer a question uh, with regards to uh, other, other um, things that people use, for instance, uh, wearables, whether a, uh, um, a Fitbit or a, uh, a smartwatch. Uh, I think that that would be very important for uh, FDA to hear about the things that you do to monitor um, your health and well-being. Um, there's a trend now, and I think that the FDA is trying to respond to, uh, to these new technologies and uh, potentially include them in clinical trials. So if any of you uh, have experiences that uh, help you to, uh, to monitor and, uh, and understand uh, uh, your well-being and health uh, using those, uh, those different technologies, I think that's important for the FDA to hear as well. Um, so we, we're at the top of the hour. Um, this was a, a very, very helpful uh, meeting uh, with you, uh, James and Larry. Um, I think uh, for any of, uh, of our audience, uh, this was just a, a webinar to prepare for the actual PFED meeting, which will take place on the 25th. And I think, uh, Carmen, if you can uh, put this on the screen and just uh, uh, lead us to the end of, uh, of this webinar, uh, I would appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ovid, and, and thanks to our guests too. Uh, we're so glad that you were able to join us today. We hope you enjoy this free webinar. I've posted a link to the Solve YouTube page where the recording will be posted as soon as it becomes available. And if you'd like to see more of our educational webinars like this one, please feel free to make a gift to our organization at solveme.org or slash donate, or you can even use this QR code. Thanks again, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for having us.